Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your moderator, Ms. Kay Phillips, Senior Director at the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead, Ms. Phillips. Hello and welcome everyone to today's on-call webinar, which is the first of a three-part series called Transforming Care for the Elderly. Today's session is entitled Appropriate Use of Antipsychotics in Long-Term Care, Practices, Outcomes and Lessons Learned from CFHI's Pan-Canadian Antipsychotic Reduction Collaborative. I'm Kay Phillips, Senior Director here at Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, and I'm pleased to be your host today. As I introduce our guest speakers, if you haven't done so, I do ask that you please take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat box, as well as let us know how many people are attending from your location using the poll on your screen. Joining us today, we welcome Dale Moffitt. Dale is the VP of Quality and Consulting for Sienna Senior Living. Dale has 25 years of experience as an industry leader in long-term care, having held various positions from a frontline staff nurse, nurse consultant, and director of care. As the VP of Quality and Consulting for Sienna Senior Living, Dale is responsible for clinical, data analytics, informatics, RIE MDS, quality management, performance improvement, and management consulting. So welcome, Dale. We also have with us John Hurdies. John is a professor in the School of Public Health and Health Systems with the University of Waterloo. Dr. Herdes is a senior Canadian fellow and a board member of InterRI, an international consortium of researchers from over 35 countries. He chairs InterRI's International Network of Excellence in Mental Health and the InterRI Network of Canada. He's also a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Sciences. We also have with us our producers Sheena Powell and Kelly Ripley operating behind the scenes here in Ottawa and with me as well Jennifer Major, one of our leads on this file. I welcome all of you. We're pleased to provide simultaneous interpretation for an all on-call webinars, so this may result in a few quick pauses in the dialogue today. We do invite you to participate in our chat box today in either official language. So on we go. On today's webinar, we want to walk you through and ensure that you've learned about CFHI's innovative approach to improve appropriate prescribing of antipsychotic medication. How a team from Sienna Senior Living, one of the largest long-term care providers in Ontario, has adapted and implemented CFHI's approach across all its homes, and results from a longitudinal analysis showing successful overall impact of CFHI's Pan-Canadian Antipsychotic Reduction Collaborative and some of the key learnings. For those of you who are new to our organization, CFHI is a non-for-profit Pan-Canadian organization committed to supporting Canadian healthcare sectors um, accelerate the design, implement, and spread of innovations that improve the patient and family experience of care to essentially result in better health and value. Between 2014 and 2015, CFHI worked with 15 quality improvement teams and experts from across Canada and internationally on a pan-Canadian spread collaborative that involved over 50 long-term care facilities focused on appropriate prescribing of antipsychotics for residents with dementia in long-term care. One of our extra teams, which is a, one of CFHI's flagship executive training programs from the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority led by Cynthia Sinclair and Jill Puchniak, a couple years back, improved the lives of residents in long-term care homes across their region. Through their project, staff were trained in using data-driven, resident-centered, dementia-friendly approaches to ensure residents, families, physicians, and staff were working together to investigate medication management and try to innovate approaches to manage the behavior and psychological symptoms of dementia. This team's initiative caught CFHI's attention as we were scouting innovations to move from local settings to spreading across Canada. It hit a burning platform and had concrete results that demonstrated better care, better health, and better value. The hypothesis of the appropriate use of antipsychotic collaborative 
was that engaging care teams in a quality improvement collaborative that builds skills in resident-centered approaches to dementia care, regular medication reviews, de-prescribing guidelines, and real-time data coding and collection can result in reductions in inappropriate use of antipsychotic medications in nursing homes. It can result in improved quality and experience of dementia care for nursing home residents, families, and staff. And it could build individual and organizational capacity in leading resident-centered and data-driven dementia care innovations. Now, throughout the collaborative, some of the core components of the interventions that the long-term care homes established were education to all staff to increase the skills to devise and deliver person-centered approaches to dementia care. They also took on multidisciplinary teamwork and communication, whether it be between families, leadership, physicians, pharmacists, and other frontline staff. Again, medication reviews on a regular basis, at least at the very least quarterly, and often more frequently, was a key part of the reduction strategy, as well as the deep prescribing guidelines that came along with the change package, including behavioral tracking and other tools for the work. In terms of the resources and support that CFHI offered, it included training through interactive webinars and face-to-face -face workshops, resources such as tools to guide the gradual reduction of medication, coaching uh, both by content and improvement experts from across Canada and internationally. Cross-team sharing was a key component where online learning and peer review of ideas and exchange could happen, as well as critical here was measurement and evaluation, coaching and training in the data collection, coding, and analysis of the inter and other complementary data. As I mentioned, the inter was a critical component for this collaborative. All homes participating in the collaborative were required to be using the inter LTC assessment. And Dr. Herdes will share with us more work and evaluation results from a study we did on, the, on this component. Key to measuring success right from the get-go was identifying the target cohorts that the homes were taking on. So this was defined very clearly at the beginning and all the homes worked with this operational definition. Based on residents in LTC facilities who were receiving antipsychotic medications without a diagnosis of psychosis. The inclusion criteria included residents receiving an antipsychotic and exclusion criteria included schizophrenia, Huntington's chorea, hallucinations and end of life residents. In total, over 570 residents were identified who actually fit the inclusion criteria and were followed throughout the duration of the collaborative. In terms of how we were going to measure our success, some of the key indicators that we captured from the inter include reductions and decreases in antipsychotics and no unintended consequences, including aggressive behaviors, restraints, and falls. You'll hear more about some of the measures through Dale's presentation on Sienna's approach. All teams, though, did collect a common set of core outcome, process, and balancing measures that helped us understand across the homes what the results were and where improvements could be made. A key measure of success was engaged, knowledgeable, and skilled staff. We know building capacity was a critical component, not just um, ha bringing forward new guidelines, that, that engagement was a critical part. And with that would come a culture shift at the organization, as well as unit facility spread that their aims for these were achieved, and also a return on investment of the efficiencies and gains. Now in terms of our results, what did we achieve by the end of 14-month collaborative? At the end of the day, we reached 56 long-term care facilities and over 7,000 residents across eight provinces. Overall, the teams that were able to submit data to us achieved a 54% reduction and or discontinuation of the antipsychotic medication. While there was a reduction in the antipsychotic use, we also did not see an increase in other psychotropic medications, which was very important to ensure that while residents were coming off the drugs, that they weren't being supplemented with other psychotropics. In terms of other outcomes and data we collected from the RIE, we didn't see increases in falls or verbal abusive behaviors, no increases in aggressive behaviors, resistance to care, and decreases in socially inappropriate behaviors. 
In terms of additional measures of success we looked at at the program level, uh, we undertook a return on investment analysis working with an organization called Risk Analytica last year uh, and going into this year, as well as I mentioned, Dr. Hurdy is working closely with his team, helped undertake a longitudinal comparative analysis of participating and non-participating homes. And Dr. Hurdy will share with us his results in a couple of moments. Around the um, return on investment analysis, what it demonstrated essentially was that with the uh, assumption that one in four long-term care residents is in an, uh, on an antipsychotic without a diagnosis of psychosis, that if it were to be scaled this program across Canada over the next five years, that we would be able to reach over 35 residents each year. That would essentially account to avoiding 25 million antipsychotic prescriptions which would essentially potentially prevent 91,000 falls, 7,000 hospitalizations, 19,000 ER visits, and ultimately saving the system over $190 million. At this point, I'd like to welcome Dale Moffitt from Sienna Senior Living to provide us with uh, stories and account of her team's and the home's experience um, through the Pan Canadian AUA Collaborative. Over to you, Dale. Thank you very much. Um, it's an absolute pleasure, pleasure to be um, sharing our results with everyone today. It's such a remarkable story and the work that CFHI and uh, Dr. Jerome Herney's team and all the homes in the collaborative, what they've done has just been remarkable to improve the quality of care for our residents. Michael is our first, is one of our residents that uh, came into long-term care who was walking to eat independently and due to behaviors uh, in conjunction with the family, he was put on antipsychotics. Unfortunately, those antipsychotics weren't reviewed uh, until the actual project. And when the project came along, because his behaviors were so bad and he was put on the antipsychotics, it ended up over time that he was actually, he wasn't able to eat without assistance, he couldn't walk without assistance, he lost a lot of his abilities. So he was put on the program with the um, family's uh, permission as well as with all the pharmacists, et cetera. And he was deemed a good candidate. And over time, he was removed from the antipsychotics. And on <clears throat> to this day, he has drastically changed. He is now able to walk again. He now has conversations with his family. He's happy, and he's attending programs more than he ever had before. So Michael is one of our, just one of our many success stories. So a little bit about our data. Next. So our background is we focused on this program. We wanted to make sure that we were successful. And in order to be successful with the program, don't go all in. Um, go slow, take it slow, feel it out, see how the program grows. And you can see um, for the entire organization, we were around 33% of our uh, residents on the antipsychotics, and that's a fair chunk of residents since uh, we have about 5,700 in the province of Ontario. And as of June of this year, our percentage is now down to 20.7. So the success of the program has been remarkable. It's absolutely been fantastic. Next. So from the cohort, um, and uh, you'll see that we did have a 34.08 performance improvement. But actually, during the cohort, we had a 50% improvement in the removal of residents from antipsychotics. And that was due to the strategy that Sienna and CFHI employed. Next. So when you embark or throughout your, strat throughout your process, review your residents who are on antipsychotics. Review their MDS scores. Look at what their scores is. Look at the coding. The coding is really important. If your coding's not correct right off the bat, then you can fix that and that will adjust. You want to make sure you um, target residents um, who have had past regret, who have had past aggression, behavioral issues in their dementia. Start slow. 
Choose one resident per home area and work with your team in order to move forward. Next. Next slide. So for the strategy for reduction, um, you have to, your senior leadership and your senior managers of your organization, uh, whether you're a single home or a single entity or part of a larger group of homes, it's on, make sure that the senior leaders in your organization are familiar with the program, familiar with the successes, and what your strategy for implementation is going to be. Include your physicians, um, include your families, include your residents and your staff when you're discussing what the project is going to be. Doing your planning up front will actually help the success of your program. And go slow. Identify residents uh, per unit, the ones that are the easier wins within your organization, um, and that will help you move the process. Staff will be reluctant at first because they don't want behaviors to come back. Include your staff in the education. Include them in the ongoing process. And then when they start seeing results, the buy-in will continue on and they'll get more and more excited about reducing the antipsychotics. Have team huddles. Use um, your pharmacist. Use your physios. Look at the falls. Make sure you use all those pieces of information as you go through. By doing the tracking, you can actually monitor the resident's behaviors, falls, risk. How are they doing as you titrate the dosing down? And your physician is a major and key player of this program. Conference calls and constant communication with the family on the progression of the reduction of the antipsychotic and how their loved one is actually behaving and how they are reacting to the reduction and the slow titration down from the drug is also key. And continue on with your tracking with your residents as you finish them off the program because you want to make sure that they can be maintained off the program and no sudden changes happen or any changes in behavior. You want to monitor and maintain and monitor, monitor for those changes in status. Next. Next slide. Yeah. So there is a toolkit um, for, uh, that we produced in conjunction with CFHI on how to start how to flow through this process, how to engage your team members, and re-education, and constant re-education. So this is a flow chart on how you can actually move through the process. This flow chart has been modified over time uh, throughout the project and as we uh, went through the cohorts, as well as when we expanded the program across all of our communities. So this is a, um, something that you can use in your organization to help you move forward with um, the reduction program. Next slide. So there's, there is a slide that has um, the residents at the top, and you look at when you're going through your process, are they on antipsychotics, not on antipsychotics? Are they on label, are they off label? So this is just a quick flow chart that you can actually use as you go through, um, and what was their progression? It just gives an idea as you work through your process of removal of antipsychotics from a resident, um, how you can actually streamline which residents you're going to look at. Next slide. So from our experience, um, take it slow. Um, it's really important that um, all the team members are on board, your families are on board, and your staff are on board. And communication is the key. CFHI has developed great toolkits um, to help your home and your team move through this process. Some of the key um, outcomes that we experience uh, was 54% of our residents in the cohort were able to be completely discontinued off of the antipsychotic uh, medication. And that well surpassed the 30% reduction goal. Do set goals for your organization and for your home 
um, of how, where you want to be and how you're going to get there and use specific aims. I can tell you that 16% um, of those residents were placed at a lower dose. Um, they were still on the antipsychotic medication, but they just required a low, lower dose. We have now spread to the majority of our homes in Ontario with um, fantastic results. One of our homes went from 40% and they're now down to 8% utilization of antipsychotics by going through this program. It does work uh, and it's extremely beneficial. We also measured um, the depression rating scores, the CPS scores, um, the aggression rating scores and their social index of social engagement. So when they came, residents came off of the antipsychotics, their depression actually reduced. Uh, their, their cognitive performance actually improved a little bit. And their increase in engagement in meaningful activities improved. And this was a fantastic story um, for these residents and for the families and the staff. And it tells a great uh, story, and it helps get your uh, keep the program going uh, as you move along. Next slide. We did surveys um, with our staff and our residents. Um, you can see where our results are now. We were most of our homes are getting below or at provincial average. We do have a ways to go, uh, and we continue on with those homes. Next slide. Cultural change, um, antipsychotics, it's understanding from a frontline point of view and from a physician point of view, antipsychotics are not uh, your first defense for behaviors. Staff will question this, um, but as they go through the program, um, they will actually see that antipsychotics will not be the first line of defense and they won't be picking up the phone to call the physician for um, an antipsychotic. They'll be using behavior management, they'll be using a number of other ish, number of other strategies. Physicians actually start communicating uh, more frequently, more often, and um, uh, regarding the utilization of antipsychotics as they go through the program, and they're part of the strategy to reduce the antipsychotics. Continually uh, monitoring and doing, doing one resident at a time on a resident home area and continually monitoring the progress of your residents uh, that have, are on the program and have been removed from the program or been successful in their reduction. Continue to monitor those residents. And it keeps an eye on the program and it keeps moving it forward. The quarterly reviews continue with the physicians um, with the antipsychotic um, reduction in mind and making sure that they're on the right track without the antipsychotics. Checking PSI scores and continually checking your scores from your RIE MDS and ensuring the accurate coding and documentation. Those are key um, areas to be looking at. Next. So make your formal tool uh, for observing residents, there you put it in place, uh, determine who's on a candidate, it's a better process for medication reviews, um, your physicians are now consulting with the homes more and more interactive with your physician engagement and your BSO programs, um, and it actually has increased the communications between the nurses and pharmacists. There was a lot of training, but we had a 95% satisfaction rating with that training course. Um, and we've had amazing successes with the program. Next. So the team experience, uh, families and residents have been extremely uh, engaged and pleased with the program. Um, our interdisciplinary team collaboration has actually improved across our organization as we have gone through this process and has built capacity amongst our team members for behaviors, falls management, medication utilization, et cetera. And it's created a lot stronger relationships. Next. So some of our lessons learned is take it slow. Um, and more and more of the healthcare sector is uh, aware of this program. So, and the 
your community partners, your physicians, your pharmacists are getting on board, but take it slow, one resident at a time as you go forward and continually monitor. Your leadership is also an extremely important part of this and them being on board with the program will continue to move it forward and your organization will see successes. Next. So make sure looking, set your goals and continually set your goals. We set a goal of 20%. Uh, we find out tomorrow if, uh, when the new CONHA results come out, if we've made it. we made it down to 20.7. Set stretch goals. It's not just the provincial average. Um, if you can reduce your antipsychotics, uh, continually set stretch goals for yourself. We can reduce this. It has been shown through research, through, and John Hurdy's, uh will speak about this. We can reach a um, uh, uh, better reduction with our residents on antipsychotics as we continue to move forward as a sector. Next. So thank you very much. Um, that's a brief overview of our results. It has been very successful in a short period of time. Um, it has been 18 months to two years, but we've just brought homes on in the last um, eight, eight, 10 months and they're already seeing 50 to 60% reductions in their antipsychotics. So I hope the help information was helpful, and uh, good luck with your programs. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dale. Really instructive and insightful presentation from your end. And to hear about, you know, although the formal program wrapped up uh, last year, to hear about your experience sustaining and continuing the gains is, is just uh, is so fascinating. Now, we do have a question from Susan McCauley uh, for you, Dale. And she was wondering what tool or system Sienna uses to track or measure behavioral expressions of people living with dementia. Could you reflect on that a bit, Dale, please? Certainly. So we do use um, several uh, tools. Um, some have been created through the uh, BSO, uh, looking at behaviors and how we track them. Um, we do have a behavior from our BSO programs that we have developed, behavior tracking systems, um, and modified the tools slightly. We also use point of care. Um, where we monitor behaviors um, and um, what are the interventions that help. Using PIECES and the PIECES program um, is also a benefit. So it's a combination of several things brought together in a process uh, that helps us with behavior, behavior management, reduction of behaviors. Um, obviously medication utilization is one of them and looking at side effects but it's a number of pieces that we've brought together to help reduce our behaviors. Thanks, Dale. Um, I, I see that Susan is still typing. Uh, it looks like in the meantime, though, we have a, a question or a comment from Andrew. So first off, congratulations on the wonderful results. Now, given them, what reasons were provided for those homes not opting to participate in the spread process? Um, it's not that they haven't opted in. Um, they are, it is on their plan to reduce. Um, as we know, there are uh, some homes were faster at adopting than others, and operational issues may come forward. This is a priority um, for our communities. All homes are actually now on the program. Um, some are slower at the adoption and require a little bit more support, and we're now providing that for them. Uh, to help them with the process, uh, but all homes are on it. It's not that they didn't adopt it, they were just later on in the process of when they actually got onto the program. Great, thank you, Dale. And now a final question from Susan before we move on. So likewise to her question earlier, what if any tools or systems have you been using to measure change of behavior or ways of engaging the PLWDs of home care, uh, of care home workers? So our PSWs, our registered staff, frontline staff, program staff, um, are all involved in uh, behavior management um, with our residents. We review our residents on a regular basis, as well as with the um, uh, through Chi High and the MDS, Rye MDS. We actually have a very comprehensive review every quarter 
um, which involves frontline to family um, on the behaviors, changes in behaviors, uh, looking at their scores, looking at the opportunities, and implementing the appropriate strategies in conjunction with the families and the staff um, to look at the reduction of behaviors. The RIMDS is a key tool for us, uh, and the Interdisciplinary Care Conference. We also do huddles with our team um, all, when their behaviors seem to escalate, and we'll actually do team huddles in the morning um, to help inform uh, frontline staff on any changes to intervention. That's, that's very helpful, Dale. And I guess to Susan's point or question, were there specific tools you used to look at staff behavior specifically? Not necessarily the resident, but the actual worker behaviors. So our work the, from the staff, um, we absolutely look at training. Um, we look at pieces training as well um, and helping the staff understand how to manage behaviors. We have a lot of training modules. We do one-on-one. -on -one. The BSO does a lot of one-on-one -on -one with our frontline staff to help them understand and help manage the behaviors. It's not necessarily a specific tool, but we do have a lot of training um, and coaching. It is a coaching model. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dale. And, and I would say as well, Susan, as a part of the overall program, the AUA collaborative program, that a part of the final surveys that we did, it was a bit more retrospective, but we were learning as we went as well in some areas, um, is asking the organizations and homes about uh, their staff and their organization's experience in taking up and routinizing the process. So kind of learning about some of the uh, techniques and, and and developments that their organizations experienced as they took up this practice. So that was just some indication for us in terms of how they did that and what that looked like uh, for us to learn about behaviors more retrospectively. Um, so thank you very much, Dale. Some really great questions that have come in. And at this point, um, just so we can stay on, on track here, I'm going to, we're going to switch gears and uh, hear from Dr. John Hurdies um, to speak to the longitudinal comparative analysis of participating and non-participating long-term care homes in this CFHI Pan-Canadian AUA Collaborative. So over to you, John. Okay, thanks, Kay. Uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us today for this uh, webinar on what I, I think has been a really exciting uh, national initiative, and I'm grateful that my research team got to play um, a role in this study. So what we'd like to do is show you the results from uh, the research that we did using the uh, national data holdings to compare against uh, homes participating in the CFHI uh, initiative. And, and I should acknowledge at the outset a very important collaborating partner for us was the Canadian Institute for Health Information who provided access to the comparative data uh, for the analysis that you're going to see. Um, so um, in case you're not familiar uh, with Intri, Intri is a not-for-profit network of about 100 uh, researchers and about 30 uh, or more countries. We do research to create these assessment systems and then do a research to think about how to use these assessments uh, in order to uh, improve quality of care. And I, I think the, the CFHI collaborative is really an ultimate example of what intra -I envisioned our instruments would be used for. They, you know, they can be used to identify need, identify potential quality issues, and at the person level uh, drive changes in care, and then we can um, monitor those over time so we can evaluate the quality of care later on as a result of those in interventions. Um, we have a large series of instruments uh, used uh, nationally uh, across Canada for today's purposes. Uh, we're focusing on the uh, instruments used in nursing homes and complex continuing care hospitals, uh, but we do have a paper in development looking at antipsychotic use in other sectors uh, as well, and there's some interesting things that we've learned from looking at their use in home care, in acute hospitals with ALC patients, in complex continuing care, and in nursing home settings. Um, and uh, Kay's uh, already shown uh, this slide. Um, you know, the, the key thing about intra instruments is that we can use them for 
uh, the data from them for multiple purposes. At the person level, we can use it to identify needs for care plans and track outcomes over time. But at the organization level, uh, we have a series of embedded risk-adjusted quality indicators that we can use to evaluate the quality of care. And that's, that's really um, uh, key here that, you know, gathering these data one time um, can serve these various purposes and help drive uh, change at the individual and population levels. Um, so for the uh, purposes of the evaluation that we did in, in this study, uh, we used five quarters of data. So we went from April, 20, April 2014 to June 2015. Uh, and what we're interested in is at the nursing home level, looking at the rate of 13 different risk-adjusted quality indicators. And we were comparing the rates in organizations participating in the CFHI initiative and those not participating in the CFHI initiative served as control uh, homes. But we also wanted to do person-level analysis to look at changes in use of antipsychotics at the individual level, not just at, at the nursing home rate uh, level. So I'll show you um, both examples in the uh, coming slides. Um, so this slide is just a comparison of the um, participants in the, um, uh, the CFHI study homes and the ones that were not in the study homes. So the green um, uh, bars here are the uh, percentages for that characteristic in CFHI, and then the, uh, the, the light blue is for the non-CFHI homes. And what you see is whether you're looking at age, uh, gender, or diagnosis, the two types of home were remarkably similar. So there were not major selection biases that came into play in terms of the kinds of residents that participate in the CFHI initiative compared to those not in the CFHI initiative. So there's nothing here to suggest to me that there's a major um, bias in the, the types of populations being included in, in this initiative. Uh, there were differences in terms of the, po the provinces represented. So um, there were more uh, homes in the CFHI initiative from British Columbia compared to the national average uh, um, for BC. And in Ontario, there were um, somewhat fewer homes in the CFHI initiative proportionally compared to Ontario's representation in the, uh, the, the national data. So we do see some differences in the resources that people received and that owes largely to what province they're from. And particularly, there were practice pattern differences in people getting physio and uh, recreation therapy services. But none of those differences um, are sufficiently serious for me to be concerned about the uh, validity of the results that, that I'll be showing you. OK, so let's think about the, uh, the nursing home level uh, analysis. So what we're going to be looking at are a series of graphs of risk-adjusted quality indicators. So what I mean by that is we have the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria that Kay mentioned earlier, but we also use a variety of other clinical uh, risk factors at the person level to risk-adjust for the use of, of antipsychotics. So we adjust, for example, uh, for severity of cognitive impairment or age of, of the resident so that those differences are, are, are controlled for uh, as well in the analyses. Um, so if we look at this particular quality indicator, the numerator is, did you get an antipsychotic in the last seven days? So that's what, what we're counting here. Uh, the denominator, the people included, are anyone with a, a valid assessment, uh, except we don't look at the admission assessment to look at the rate of the, of the quality indicator at admission, because these may be antipsychotics that came with the person. It's, it's the antipsychotic use once they've been on service for 90 days or more in your home. Uh, we look at a variety of covariates that either increase or decrease the likelihood of use. So um, um, cognitive impairment uh, would be one of them. And then we exclude people where uh, antipsychotic use would be appropriate. So for example, the, um, um, uh, the presence of, an, of a schizophrenia diagnosis. Uh, would lead to exclusion because then their antipsychotic use is not a problem. We also do some complicated facility level stratification where we basically create a standardized population for comparison. If you're familiar from the epidemiological literature uh, with age standardized mortality rates, it's kind of like that where we look at a major stratification variable and then we force all populations to have a shared distribution so that we're, we know that we're, we're comparing apples to apples. So there's a great deal of technical adjustment that goes into this to be sure that we're comparing apples to apples across these homes and over time. So 
what we have here is really the key graph uh, to understand um, from um, the quality indicator analysis. So I'll take some time to step through this. So first of all, what we have here are box plots. On the left-hand side, we have the CFHI participating facilities. On the right side, the ones not participating in the initiative. What we have in the box plot in the middle, that little black square, is the median rate for those homes at that time period. So in this case, for the CFHI homes, the median rate was just below 30%, was, was the adjusted quality indicator rate. Then the top of the box is the 75th percentile, the bottom is the 25th percentile, the, um, the, the round um, black dot at the bottom is the 20th percentile, and the gray dot at the top is the 80th percentile. So a way to think about this is for the, the, the black dot at the bottom, 20% of homes have a rate of, in this case, 25% or lower uh, in their home. The median is the 50% mark. So half the homes had a rate of 29% or lower, and 80% of the homes had a rate of about 41% or lower. So the lower the rate, the, the, the closer you are to the bottom, the better the home, the higher uh, the rate, the poorer the performance with respect to this quality indicator. Now, the thing about quality indicator box plots is that they can be kind of subtle, and, and it's, it's sometimes hard to see what's going on, but it's pretty clear. If you look at every spot in this distribution, you see a substantial reduction at the facility level in the rate of antipsychotic use. So for the medium homes, it's going from 29% to around 24%. In the best homes, it was going from around 24% down to around 15%. In the worst performing homes, it was going from around 41% um, down to um, uh, below 30%. So in the CFHI homes, every home in this distribution improved. The entire distribution moved, not just the keener homes. What we saw in the non-CFHI homes is there was also a reduction uh, in those distributions, but not quite a sharper reduction as we saw in the CFHI homes. To put this in a little bit simpler terms, if we look at the first quarter compared to the last quarter and look at a different score, for the best homes in CFHI, they improved by a reduction of almost 9% compared to about 3% of non-CFHI homes. The medium homes improved by 6% compared to 4% in non-CFHI homes, and the worst performing homes improved by 12% compared to about 4% in the non-CFHI homes. So in each part of the distribution, the improvement that we saw in the CFHI homes was greater than we saw in the improvement in uh, that point in the distribution in other parts of uh, the country. At the same time, we looked at other quality indicators. So in this case, we're looking at uh, the behavior quality indicator. Um, generally, we, we, these look reasonably flat. The only question we have is whether in this final quarter there was a slight turn up. In, quality in, in the behavior quality indicator for the medium level homes. And so we're continuing this time series analysis to see is this a blip or is there a trend of change in, in behavior at, at the home level. Uh, for the best homes, they seem pretty stable. For the worst performing homes, they went up a little bit. And so we need to know is that a blip or not. Um, and we saw a similar kind of um, um, relatively flat pattern for the non-CFHI. Uh, homes uh, with just a little bit of noise uh, from quarter to quarter. Um, okay, so then let's look at the person level analysis. So um, what you've just seen are quality indicators at the nursing home level. And I've showed you the box plots of the distribution of nursing home scores. Now I want to look at the level of individuals in those uh, long-term care homes. So these quality indicators tell us about population level changes, but we, all, we also want to know what happened at the person level because it could be that changes in the QIs are just a reflection of a different composi uh, composition of the nursing home population over time. You, you know, so you want to be sure that this, it's not just changes in the home over overall. And you want to be sure that individuals also benefited from the, um, uh, th these uh, quality improvement uh, initiatives. Um, but a big challenge here is that these CFHI interventions were happening at the same time as many other provincial initiatives to reduce antipsychotic use. So we need to know, is this just part of a secular trend across 
um, provinces, or is there an additional effect of CFHI beyond what, what those homes did? And we also want to look at factors other than what was in the, the quality indicator to see are there's a broader range of covariants that might be influencing uh, performance on this particular uh, indicator. Um, now, we always have to worry about the, an issue of ascertainment bias, um, uh, that there may be some facilities that are more or less focused on uh, detecting clinical issues, and that may change their, um, that pattern may be consistently associated over time, which means that that bias might affect longitudinal trends as well. So you need statistical models to control for that type of ascertainment bias. Um, and so there are new statistical techniques that allow us to deal with these data. But the surprising thing we learned is that the data sets now are already so large that even some of the most advanced statistical models cannot handle data of the size. So, so we're truly in a, in a big data world. It's an interesting um, um, problem that has emerged, but we did find some analytic solutions to, to let us uh, deal with that. So this slide is, is really um, one of the key slides to think about. It looks at the effect of the CFHI intervention um, uh, for all participating problems uh, controlling for the province that the person was in and excluding people who had hallucinations, delusions, uh, sch schizophrenia, or Huntington's uh, chorea. So really what this is about is did the CFHI initiative have an effect over and above the changes that were happening at the provincial level? Now, in part, it depends on what look-back period uh, you look at, but if, if you were to sort of um, use January 2014 as the start point um, as sort of a mid-level solution, what you see is that the adjusted odds ratio for staying on an antipsychotic in the participating homes was 0.8. What that means is that there is a 20% reduction of staying on antipsychotics if you're in a CFHI home after we control for what province you're in. So what that's saying is that the CFHI initiative had an effect beyond the provincial changes that we know uh, were happening in, in Canada. Um, then we can also look at these elaborate uh, statistical models to look at other factors that come into play. So we can do models that look at the CFHI intervention, what gender the person had, whether they had aggressive behavior, what their cognitive performance was like, and their age pattern. So we can control for uh, these different factors. And even after we control for all these factors and we exclude people according to the quality indicator uh, rates, we still see the adjusted odds ratio for the CFHI intervention is 0.8. So after I control for gender, aggressive behavior, cognition, age, schizophrenia, Huntington's, delusions, and hallucinations, there's still a 0.8 um, um, rate of having of staying on an antipsychotic or a 20% reduction in the likelihood of staying on antipsychotic for those residents who are in the CFHI homes. And when we did those analyses stratified by province, we again found a similar kind of thing. So in um, um, uh, Saskatchewan and Ontario, we're below uh, 0.8, so that meant that it was about a 20% or greater reduction uh, in the odds, but in Newfoundland and, and Alberta, it wasn't quite as big effect, but still a significant effect. So in Alberta, we're, who's had a huge uh, initiative to reduce antipsychotic use, the CFHI homes still had about a 18% reduction in the likelihood of residents staying on an antipsychotic compared to the rest of Alberta homes. So my concluding comments uh, on this is that there's lots of evidence um, here that the CFHI initiative improved patterns of antipsychotic use um, uh, and the improvement out, outpaced what we saw in the non-CFHI homes. We risk adjusted for the um, uh, population differences, so we're not concerned that differences in patient populations confounded um, uh, this. And we also did not see a, um, a marked change in quality indicators. Uh, particularly around um, uh, restraint use uh, was one example I didn't show you, but around behavior, uh, we saw a little bit of, of noise, uh, like I said, at the tail end, so we want to continue to follow that, follow that longitudinally to be sure that um, um, the flat trend uh, continues, but we did not see a massive um, switch to more restraint use um, 
uh, more behavior disturbance, more falls, uh, all those other um, quality indicators that we took a, a look at. And we saw the, uh, these effects both at the person and at the uh, facility level. So I'll stop there and take questions and comments. Great. Thank you very much, John. At this point, I don't see any further questions in the chat box. Um, but John, I'm wondering if you can um, further clarify any upcoming or continued work uh, and maybe make a note um, to, to continue and extend this work with CFHI and, and what's in order, what the plan is. So the, the, the most important current focus that we're working on is extending that time series out by another three quarters to see how long did this uh, um, uh, effect uh, persist for. Um, because what you don't want to have happen is that there's huge enthusiasm during an intervention period, but once the intervention period is down, people let their guard down and they go back to old ways, or that, that there are other consequences that aren't managed uh, effectively. So our focus now is, now that we've established that the intervention worked in the immediate term to reduce antipsychotic use, we want to look at the long-term uh, impact of, of changes in antipsychotic use to be sure that it's both sustained and that it did, there weren't uh, unexpected negative consequences in, in other areas over the long term. Thanks, John. I guess my other question would be for people on the line, you know, you, they might be from a home that has multiple facilities or maybe a region. Um, if they are interested in this type of work where you can look at comparative uh, longitudinal analysis results, what would you say are some of the critical kind of steps or factors for undertaking this type of, uh, you know, longitudinal analysis and, and study? Well, um, one of the things just to be clear and state the obvious is that having a national standard in the form of the uh, MDS assessment that is used across Canada supported by CAHI to ensure data quality was absolutely, absolutely vital. This is, uh, I think, the largest intervention study of this type, and we could do this because we have those national standards. So that's, that's one piece. Um, but uh, the, the next critical piece of that is continuing to focus on data quality, that these data are very valuable at the person level to drive intervention, and they're essential at the population level to support evaluation. So continued due diligence on ensuring that we've got good quality data and that the assessments are done in a timely and appropriate manner is, is really uh, uh, essential. But I, I, I think in terms of having an impact on antipsychotic use or in any other quality indicator um, that you want to go to, I would go back to um, um, uh, Dale's presentation where she emphasized how important it is to use the assessment to drive care planning to understand what's going on. Incorporating this into clinical practice is essential. If you just leave it as a form that you got to fill out because somebody in a ministry told you you had to do it, you will not realize the clinical and quality improvement benefits. But if you embrace the use of these uh, assessments as they're intended to, to drive care planning and intervention, you can make huge differences in quality as we've seen in these national data and in the presentation by Dale. Thanks, John. And, and Susan has a great question. Given Quebec isn't currently on the interi, how could a province like Quebec be brought into the fold? Um, and what needs to be done to get Quebec to gather data in a way that allows the province to participate in the future of this type of collaborative work? Do you have any reflections on the state of data collection in Quebec, John, and, um, and, and some next steps that may be going on? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll give you both good news and bad news. So let me say the, the, the good news potentially first is that we do have a grant proposal in to do a pilot study with up to 10 Quebec homes with the intra long-term care facility, the new version of, of the intra assessment that would allow those participating homes to be um, benchmarked on, on the same quality uh, indicators. So um, whether that turns into something on a large-scale basis, that's for Quebec to decide, but at least we can start to do some pilots with, with those uh, participating homes. And if there's anybody from Quebec who's interested in this, I'd be happy to chat with you uh, offline. Um, so now let's move to the bad news. The bad news is that if you don't have the intra-eye instrument, there is no defensible scientific way to uh, compare your performance on these quality indicators because um, I, I think I gave you a sense of the technical complexity behind the risk adjustment um, 
strategy for this indicator, it probably takes into account 15, 16 different uh, variables. All those need to be um, um, uh, the same or consistent. So you cannot take uh, you know, a limited subset of items from the SMAF and create a quality indicator in Quebec and hope that it, it compares uh, against the rest of the, of the um, Canadian provinces using the intra data because the reality is that those measurement differences may uh, completely explain any differences we would see in Quebec on that indicator. So without this as a uh, comparative standard, I would not stand behind a crosswalk comparison of the quality indicator. You really need to have the inter data standard in to allow for a fair comparison. That, that's very helpful, John. And, and just to note to our listeners as well, um, and John, uh, for, your, for your knowledge, is that in 2017, CFHI is continuing to look at potential regional or scale, um, provincial scale opportunities in other provinces. We are currently uh, in a one year, uh, through our first year in scaling across New Brunswick, and we have one more year to go uh, to reach all 60-plus uh, homes. So if there is um, appetite in Quebec or other provinces or regions within it where some testing can go on, uh, we'd be happy to discuss with you and John uh, that type of potential. Do be in touch. Um, at this point, I want to thank both John, Dr. John Hurdies, and Dale Moffitt. Uh, fantastic presentations. It's been a pleasure to work with you for these last couple of years. As everyone can hear, uh, very exciting work. I also wanted to just flag to all of you that we do have, um, this is a part of a larger series, and we will have an upcoming webinar um, on improving outcomes in dual diagnosis specialized care. That's a, a, different, uh, a different topic, but uh, you're welcome to join that. Also, the evolution of patient and family engagement and partnership models in Quebec is a webinar coming up by CFHI on December 15th. As a part of this series on transforming care for the elderly, our next session is January 11th, uh, a topic on ensuring that seniors receive appropriate and person-centered care. Um, this will really be about engaging pharmacists and interdisciplinary care teams to improve prescribing uh, and to curtail polypharmacy. We know that there is a broader discussion of medication management and polypharmacy overall. Uh, that is certainly uh, you know, an important topic uh, as a part of this. You can have a look at our full lineup of on call on the link uh, that's provided on this slide. At this point, once again, thank you to everyone. We really appreciate your feedback. It's invaluable for our future webinar design. We ask that you just take a moment now to provide us some feedback on today's session. We also invite you to sign up for our CFHI newsletter and keep an eye on your email for a full listing of upcoming webinar and other educational opportunities. So this does conclude today's webinar. Thanks for taking your lunch time or uh, your post-lunch or early lunch with us, and we hope that you do have a great day. Take care.